Okay, so welcome back to uh, the third week of new 332, uh, 25th of January, 2021. Um, right, so uh, as a second component of the lecture half on Buddhism, today we're gonna be talking about the five uh, skandhas. Now, in conversation with um, you know, a bunch of students, it's become clear to me that uh, there's sort of a broader array of familiarity with some stuff than um, perhaps I assumed uh, right off the bat. So I was operating sort of on the assumption that um, pretty much everybody that was taking this would have previously taken 232. Uh, and uh, partly that's uh, my fault. Uh, well, I mean, it's largely my fault. Uh, because that used to be the case. Um, 232 was a prerequisite for 332, and I think perhaps it isn't anymore. They've sort of changed the formulation to make them somewhat more standalone. Um, so I sort of figured that people would have a bit of baseline Buddhism. So uh, that is tricky. I had intended, of course, obviously, to keep the Buddhist side of things fairly fundamental. Like I'm trying not to get too far out and exotic, or at least where I am, I will try to sort of signpost those things a little bit if we're talking about specific techniques. Um, but, you know, I've, I've had messages from a few students who, um, you know, are looking for something of sort of a basic primer. So to be perfectly honest, you get any introduction to Buddhism that should cover the kinds of things that we're likely to talk about. As I said, I'm deliberately keeping things close to the foundations, right? Um, sort of relatively shared terms, fairly basic concepts, because I think that that's often an interesting point of contact, particularly for a third, third year course. Um, I don't have, however, the space in the course to teach uh, all of those basic concepts kind of in detail. So I would suggest you grab yourself, you know, some introduction to Buddhism, something relatively straightforward. There are lots of good books out there, and frankly, lots of websites that will explain the basics. I mean, you can kind of trawl through Wikipedia, and you're going to get uh, most of what you kind of need. Um, uh, another thing that people had asked me about was uh, sort of slides and or, um, you know, annotation slash subtitles or something. Um, and unfortunately, I won't be doing either of those. Uh, so for, for slides, as I've mentioned in a couple of places and to several people, um, A, I don't typically use slides. I'll use diagrams sometimes if I think that they're necessary, but I don't generally use slides. Uh, the reason being that you know, the, the, the pedagogy, the science around this is that slides aren't nearly as good for education as we tend to think. There's been a big move towards using slides and things, and actually they don't tend to work uh, nearly as well as people think they do. Um, whereas actually there is quite a bit of good evidence for a relatively, if you want to call it, conversational style of lecture. Now, I recognize that's a little trickier because it's a pretty one-sided conversation. Uh, we're having where <clears throat> I talk into my uh, webcam and you watch me on, I don't know what, your phone, your laptop, your iPad? It's a good question. Anyway, the point being, I understand it lacks a little bit of that quality. Um, and so I know that people are looking for something a bit more itemized, but just try to take notes. Like I said, you know, most of what you get, if you kind of pause it and check it, if there are kind of core terms that I've mentioned, you're like, what? What a how's that spelled? You can ask your classmates for one thing. I've put up the discussion board. So if you're like, when Anderson was talking about whatever, people I'm sure will be happy to chime in and help you. Uh, and I encourage you to do so. That's why I posted a specific thing in discussions for each lecture so that you guys can have conversations about stuff. Not just so that you can ask me, although of course you can ask me. Um, uh, you know, and there's no shame in that. If you don't know something, you don't know something. The way to know is to ask and then you know. Um, as far as sort of transcripts and subtitles go, uh, I can't, I can't. Uh, the, it's just that the workload involved in trying to do that would be extremely, um, it, it would just be too much. I, I have too much on my plate. Now, if somebody wants to produce a transcription, right? Um, you know, I would say if you're gonna produce a transcript of the lectures, then you should go and collect your, you know, your uh, potential bonus marks for doing notes and you want to submit them. So if somebody wants to produce basically notes, okay, you can obviously submit them for bonus marks, but I also encourage you to just share them with your classmates. If you take really good notes or you take a really good transcript or you've got like a list of terms that are mentioned and so on and so forth, share them. That's totally okay. 
Okay, I'm okay with that. Indeed, I encourage it. I encourage people to share their their notes. So um, yeah, I can't produce a, a transcript and I can't produce subtitling. Unfortunately, I just I just don't have the time in my schedule. I'm uh, busier even than I would like. Um, and I enjoy this, but like lecturing is in and of itself a fair time commitment. So yeah, but I encourage people to share that stuff. So first off, okay. And the same goes for Buddhist terms. The other thing is, okay, if any of you are like Sanskrit scholars, I apologize in advance. I am not a Sanskrit scholar. I don't speak Sanskrit. I don't speak Pali. So the language is involved, you're probably going to see me mangle pronunciation and I'm going to be playing mix and match. This is a conceptual exercise for me more than it is primarily a linguistic and cultural exercise. So while I do do re reading in the field, I would not claim certainly to have sort of linguistic expertise. And so for those of you that are familiar with that stuff and are wincing when I swap back and forth between terms in different languages that mean the same thing or whatever, uh, you know, whatever, my, my apologies, you should feel free to chastise me and or correct or clarify on the discussion boards if you like. Um, Y'all have uh, an equal share in your own education and I would encourage you to, to interact and participate with each other as well as watching me. Okay, I think that's the various logistic things. So as I mentioned today, we're gonna talk about the, the skandhas. So we discussed last week um, you know, the notion of the Four Noble Truths and very specifically, you know, the first truth and the notion of dukkha, dukkha, right? Um, typically translated as sort of suffering, right? All is suffering. Sometimes you'll get translations like all is stressful. Um, I proposed something closer to all is sort of unsatisfactory, but there is another aspect to the concept of dukkha, to the concept of suffering. Uh, and that is that very often it's tied to the idea of impermanence and the fact that things are conditioned, that they are impermanent and that they are conditioned. Okay, so let's talk about those sort of a little bit. One of the ideas in Buddhism, as we discussed, when we talked about anatman, the idea that there is sort of no central self, right? That there's no essence right? We, things are a collection of features, but they're not essential or eternal, okay? They're just a collection of features that comes together and it's impermanent and it washes away. You can see that obviously, right? In certain kinds of um, art and things that you will see produced within Buddhist cultures. So the most famous version of this, okay, is uh, the Tibetan Buddhist practice of sand painting, okay? Sand painting, if you've ever seen this. If you haven't, uh, look on YouTube. You can find them doing it. You may need to fast forward it, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, although if you're a trooper, watch the whole thing. So these sand paintings work. And what happens? You get like a monk or a lama who has a variety of different kinds of colored sand. Okay. And they're very carefully creating a big pattern on like a big smooth floor. So imagine like a big marble floor and, and they're taking just tiny amounts of sand to create this incredibly intricate pattern, right? Often a big mandala, right? A big sort of circle, spiritual circle that um, serves as a kind of map and illustration of the universe as it were. So you'll get like a great big mandala with right incredibly fine details that they're getting by sprinkling the sand. And it'll take them a long time. When I say a long time, I mean like, you know, 24 hours, 72 hours, that kind of thing, like a long time. Okay. It's extremely meticulous. And then when it's complete, they sweep it, like they promptly like disrupt it. They make it and then they sweep their hand through it and disrupt it and destroy it. Now, a big part of this is what? They're trying to get at the notion of impermanence. If you've ever seen one of these things get, there is like a palpable feeling of oh, oh, that you have when you watch a hand go through it, right? Like imagine this is a scene that you see in movies sometimes where somebody is like setting up dominoes and you can tell that there's like a huge number of dominoes that they set up that they're gonna tip over and then somebody like comes in and slams the door and all of a sudden the dominoes are like Pfft. and you experience this feeling of like Ugh, right this is the same feeling often that you get when you watch somebody disrupt a sand painting but that's part of the point the point is that you watch this like meticulous construction and this enormous beauty get produced and then destroyed and the feeling that, oh, oh, that you're having is attachment. That is precisely the feeling they're talking about. 
The idea is that it is no different that you grow attached to any other circumstance, right? Than that you grow attached to the painting. And the feeling you have in the painting is a pretty minor one, right? I mean, you know, how much, if you did it for three days, you might have a stronger commitment, you'd get a stronger feeling. But like as an observer, you watch this thing and then seeing it get wrecked causes that visceral response. And yet you haven't participated that much in it. Now, if you consider that idea from within the Buddhist perspective, the idea is that in a sense, your attachments, yourself, your accomplishments, your life, those are like the sand painting right? You put all of this meticulous effort into making this thing. But at the end of the day, we're all going to die, young or old. You might live to a ripe old age. You, currently alive, if you're relatively young, might hypothetically be the recipient of scientific technologies that will extend your lifespan by dozens, maybe hundreds of years. But if you live to the age of 500 and then you die, you die. And your accomplishments at the end of the day, in some sense, and all of the things that you have accumulated to yourself are swept, right? They're swept. Now that's hard for people. Like it's an understatement to say that death anxiety, right? Provokes a certain kind of strong reaction to people. Obviously it does, although as we will find out from the psychology moving forward, that the uh, an encounter with death does not typically have the same kind of effects as people suspect it will or something. So we'll talk about that later. But the point is, right, that feeling of attachment that goes with um, that goes with watching something so meticulous and invested in and beautiful and so on and so forth get swept away, that is precisely the attachment that causes suffering. I mean, imagine if instead, right, it didn't get swept away, but it, you know, they had built it in the middle of like a, you know, a, a busy hall. Let's say they built it on the floor in, in a, like a busy, uh, you know, like train station. Okay. So it's like Grand Central Station and they did it and they built this thing overnight. And now what do they have to do? They have to like make sure nobody tramples through it. They have to make sure the wind doesn't get at it. They have to make sure that like, you know, a garbage cart doesn't get rolled through it. They have, right, they're sort of guarding it. That is essentially the position of attachment, right? We get situations and relationships and we get configurations of ourselves and our accomplishments in our life. And then we are panicking to keep them from being swept away. And that is the source of a great deal of our suffering, right? Is this attachment. When in fact, at the end of the day, they are necessarily impermanent. They're necessarily impermanent, right? They are not permanent, they're not eternal they're necessarily impermanent, okay? So that's the impermanence piece. If we talk about the conditioned piece, if something is conditioned, we, what we mean by conditioned in that sense is that the existence of something is dependent on the existence of something else, right? So that there is like a network of relationships and that these things happen to occur together so quickly that we see them as singular and unified. We see them as a continuity because they're sort of seamlessly moving together. So the example I like to use here, right, is um, uh, film, right, early film. So early film, right, operates at 24 frames per second. Modern film, of course, is digital and modern, you know, TVs and uh, projectors and so on and so forth typically operate at a higher frame rate. Often they operate at 60 frames a second, sometimes higher if they're really, really quite high end. Okay, so that frames per second is precisely that, right? It's the number of still images which are shown to us in a second, one after another, which give us the perception of smooth motion. You're watching frames per second right now. Right. But with early film, right, what would happen is, you know, you'd have, for those of you that have never seen this, because, you know, that doesn't get used that much anymore, but you get a long strip. And if you're hearing a squeaking sound, <laughs> if you're hearing a persistent squeaking sound in the background, which sounds a little bit like windshield wipers across a windshield. Uh, our, my partner and I's uh, guinea pigs, Thor and Loki, have been particularly kind of active for the last couple of days. Um, Guinea pigs are, have a lot more personality than people think. I was quite surprised. Um, and they're also a little bit hard to understand. That there are some, they're very vocal and they have a lot of personality, but occasionally they engage in behaviors that 
it's just we can't quite map what's going on and so they've been doing this squeaky business for like a day and a half or so we thought initially and we have thought in the past that they were fighting um but we don't think they're fighting it's hard exactly to know what's going on but anyway if you're wondering what that sound is you know i can't apologize because they live here but um that that is indeed what it is and i know the mic is quite good so anyway <clears throat> guinea guinea pig alert back to it so if you look at film, right, there's these frames per second. And if you pull a piece of film off of the film reel, right, the thing that gets fed into the projector in front of the light is like a long strip of transparent slides. Everyone is a still picture. And the idea is that the machine feeds those past the projector light at 24 per second, which is a speed at which when we are shown one still image after another at 24 frames per second, it seems, right, it's fast enough one after another that we begin to perceive it as continuous. It just seems fluid in the same way as you watching me now is occurring at uh, probably about 30 frames a second, actually, I think, given the encoding. So it's happening at about 30 frames a second. So what you're actually getting is 30 still images a second. If I were to take this, this um, file that I'm producing out and stick it into my Adobe editing machine, right, and take a look at it, what it would be would be like a lot of photos, basically, in a sequence, right? Photo, 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 photo. So that's hard to say fast. Um, so, you know, this is a kind of the idea that you get, right, which is that the, the various kind of aspects of the mind, right, are conditioned, they're impermanent, but they're, they're conditioned, they're, they rely on each other in a way, and they operate together so smoothly that they give an appearance of unity in the way that the film gives an appearance of unity. Okay, now, there are because it is not Buddhism, but Buddhisms, okay, there are lots of different systems of talking about these things, about these different aspects or parts of being, parts of mind, okay? There's a lot of different ones. You go to a slightly different part of the world or a slightly different tradition, and you're going to get a different list. And that could be quite confusing, obviously, if you're sort of getting into this stuff. When I was studying this material initially, many years ago, um, one of the ones that threw me, that some of you may be familiar with, is the 51 mental factors, okay, the 51 mental factors. And this is like a list, basically, of all of the different mental things that can occur that you can sort of identify and, and how to distinguish them and, you know, what sort of thing they are and so on and so forth, okay, and 51. Now, the thing is, there are a couple of problems. One of them is that different people have different lists. Right? In that sense, it's not so unlike different psychodynamic theorists, right? They all agree on certain fundamentals, but the specifics of their system can be quite different, right? And there can be advantages and disadvantages to different systems in the same way as there are advantages and disadvantages to different languages, right? It's not that one language is better than another language, they just do different things. But some of them do indeed describe certain things better than other languages, right? There's a reason that English uses the French word deja vu because the English term for that would be like, you know, that thing where you uh, are pretty sure that you've already seen something, but you also know that you haven't seen it. It's kind of a long sentence, deja vu, it's good, right? And, you know, for those of you that speak more than one language, you will know that there are sort of terms in your language, right, that, that will hit on specific things. Different languages are good for different things, right? They do different things. That's why, in fact, we ought to, I think, anyway, we ought to promote an absolute diversity and multiplicity of languages. Every time I hear about these small languages going extinct, I'm a little sad. It's like hearing about, you know, a rare butterfly going extinct. You know, it's easy to be like, ah, what was it doing? And the answer is it was contributing to the complexity of the system is what it was doing. And, you know, if you don't just want to have an ocean that's full of like jellyfish and slime, not, nothing against jellyfish, they're quite beautiful, but you know what I'm saying, right? You want to promote a diversity, right? Having a diversity in your ecology is important, same with languages. Anyway, sorry, that was didactic, but also polemic, so you'll excuse me. But the point is that the different formulations within Buddhism are going to have different systems with different sort of attachments. That's one problem. The other problem with looking at like the 51 mental factors when I learned them was, I was learning them in translation. And so there would be like five terms in a row and it would be like consciousness, awareness, knowing, right? Uh, sentience, um, self-consciousness, consciousness of the self. 
I'm making that up a little bit, so it's slightly tongue in cheek, but you see what I mean. Like getting the fine grained distinctions between those things might be easy if you spoke Sanskrit or Pali. And, and maybe also we're reading those texts where they get that original fine grained distinction, but reading in the translation was incredibly difficult. Some of them jumped out, but like, I would be hard pressed despite the fact that I studied it quite hard, right? To list off the 51 mental factors, right? So, um, right. So the point being, there are, you know, lots of accounts in different Buddhisms right, on how to break these things down. But one of the ones that we do encounter that's pretty common, it'll differ a little bit, okay, but it's pretty common, is the skandhas, okay? So the skandhas, which means basically heaps, right, heaps, like piles, okay, skandhas are this idea that you are not a singular unit of being, but rather that illusion is produced by the interrelationship of these uh, these sort of five skandhas, these five heaps, these five parts, okay? So, and the, the skandhas in a sense are produced by uh, interrelationships between what, what the Buddhists would think of as your six, your six senses, okay? Your six sense organs. So let's talk about that first real quick, okay? So what are these six sense organs? Okay, eyes, pretty obvious, right? Okay, ears, fairly straightforward on board there. Nose, good, good. Okay, great. Ah, tongue, right? Obviously the sense of taste, although most of that is smell, but let's not quibble. Um, body, okay, well, body, body is kind of an amalgam. So body is both touch, right? Your tactile sense of touch, but also it would include things like um, certain kinds of interoception, right? Like your uh, sense of balance or like, uh, like when you feel queasy, that kind of stuff, your internal sense or your interoception uh, and also things like balance, et cetera, et cetera, right? Your sense of your own temperature, for instance, right? All of that would be covered under body as well as touch. And then last, and this tends to kind of throw people off, mind. Mind is considered a sense organ in Buddhism. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean at some level sort of the sense of pure awareness, as we will talk about, right? But it means all of the things that your mind does when it reactively encounters things. It's your associations, for instance, right? Your associations and your memories, your reactions to things, etc. Your ability to recognize things, all of that is sort of conditioned as a sense in Buddhism, the sense of mind, okay? So these are the six senses. And those six senses are going to tend to uh, accumulate into these skandhas, the five heaps, okay? The five heaps. Okay, so the first skanda is rupa, form, okay? And form is like, you know, like the world, your sense of the solidity of the world, right? Form is also if, uh, I'm trying to find an opaque object on my desk. You know, form is, you know, the sense of solidity, but it's also things blocking, yes, it's a beholder, if for those of you that recognize it. It's also like the fact that my eyes can't penetrate this. It's a stop to my senses, right? Form, rupa, okay? Vedana is sensation, okay? So that's just sort of like raw sensation, just raw sensation. You just smell something, what's that? raw sensation, okay? Sana is recognition, right? What's that? Oh, it's cinnamon, okay? Recognition. So you think about this when you're, you're walking and it's kind of dark and you see something and you're not sure what you're seeing, right? There's a moment where you are clearly experiencing sensation at some sense, but what you aren't experiencing is a recognition of what it is. Or you get this sometimes with, you know, kind of trick pictures and things where when you look at them, you're like, what am I? Oh, there it is. And it kind of jumps out, right? You get that moment of recognition. Mm, same thing. Some, you know, you can think of this in all kinds of contexts where you're like, what is that? Mm, is it coriander? No, no, what is it? It's something, right? You're having a sensation, but you don't yet have recognition right? You don't have recognition. And the list goes on and on and on, right? So recognition is distinct as a, scan, as a skanda, sana, okay? Um, yes, and then sankara is mental formation. Okay, what does that mean, mental formation? Well, it means action. Mental formation means action, but what does that mean exactly? 
Well, you know, when things come in and, you know, it's like, okay, first there's form, then there's sensation, then there's recognition, and then all of a sudden that's going to run through a bunch of processes, right? And those other processes are going to compel us to action in various ways. So for instance, if first you're like, you know, there is, there is just form, there is something there, then there's like sensation, my feet are kind of warm. Then there's recognition. Oh my God, my bedspread's on fire. And then of course there is the mental formation. That's a set of reactions that you have. You kick the bedspread off, right? You, some other things, you put your legs out maybe. Why is your bedspread on fire? You tell me, maybe you were camping. The point is, right? Maybe you were smoking in bed uh, or it was just a stray cosmic action, tiny meteorite <laughs> through your window. Um, the point is, right, mental formation includes action because it includes all the reactions that you have to things in a certain sense, right? It comes in and you have predispositions. You can think of this in all kinds of cases. I like to think of it in some ways as being, again, highly conditioned. So there's an experiment, I love, I love, 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 which so demonstrates, right, the role of context in processing uh, this kind of thing. So here it is. What you do is you take a little bit of butyric acid Okay, butyric acid, butyric acid smells bad. When I was in high school, a guy took, uh, took a thing of, I'm laughing, but you can, you're getting my essential trickster here. A guy took some butyric acid, I don't know who, I didn't know him, it wasn't me. Um, and he took some butyric acid and he put it behind the radiator in the hallway that connected the main part of the school over to the gym and the shops and the art rooms and stuff. And this stuff smells brutal brutal so like when you went through this hallway there was just nothing they could do like it heated up and, and and sublimated and went into the hall and just like passing down this hallway for like a week was like gag worthy just brutal okay um it's kind of a funny prank i mean it's juvenile but anyway not the best prank i've ever heard but this is not a course on pranks completely so Okay, so butyric acid, but you take a, a dilute kind of butyric acid. And the thing is that butyric acid is present in a number of things. Not least, it's sort of one of the smell components in expensive cheese. So here's the experiment. What you do is you take two groups of people and you tell one of them, you're about to smell expensive cheese. And of course, not everybody likes cheese and not everybody's culture sort of uses cheese, but it, you may tell that I do like cheese, <laughs> maybe a little too much. And I'm from a cheese culture. So for me, cheese and high-end cheese is quite appealing, right? So you take some people and you say, you know, this is expensive cheese. And you put that smell underneath their nose and they'll say, mmm, right? Okay, now take the same smell. You take a second group of people and you say, this is vomit. And you put the same smell oh, and people will gag. Right? And obviously you're controlling these two groups, right? It's a, it's a well-designed experiment. But this tells you a lot about the context, right? The conditioned context around something. Your reaction to it is highly conditioned by other factors, right? So when you have a mental formation, it's not just that you're having like a knee-jerk reflexive reaction. There are other factors there. What you think you're reacting to changes a lot about your experience, but also a lot about your action, right? If you consider that, and of course, there are all kinds of other things, right? Your predispositions, cultural predispositions, things you've been trained, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That are going to cause your reactions. If you are walking through a dim twilight alley and all of a sudden something comes, you know, in front of you and it's a dog. If you're one sort of person, you might be like, oh, hi, boy. And if you're another kind of person, you might be like, right? So mental formation, right? The, the skanda, uh, uh, of mental formation, Sankara. Um, another aspect of, of that, okay, um, that often gets sort of mentioned when we're talking about these things is karma. Uh, karma is a thorny subject a little bit. Karma in its understanding in the West. It's not something we're gonna spend a ton of time on, to be honest, but you know, when we get karma imported into the West, it gets badly misunderstood. So for one thing, the West came up with the, <laughs> the idea of good karma, <laughs> which if you know about karma is like an oxymoron. Um, you know, so in the West, we have bad karma and good karma. And good karma means you did something right and now things are going to go well for you, right? Um, what, uh, you know, where bad karma is bad karma. There is only sort of bad karma. 
in a sense. It's like any karma is is impacting and determining what you're doing. If you don't want karma, you want to get rid of your karma. So that's one thing is that the, the West has innovated and created good karma. But the other thing about karma, right, is that we tend to have a very simple view of it uh, as being sort of like, well, what goes around comes around. That's often how it gets viewed in the West. It's like, well, you got what you, you know, were coming to, or wait, did I say that right? You got what was coming to you. That's what I meant, right? What goes around comes around. Uh, this is a somewhat oversimplified version. And people often think that karma is like, you know, you reap what you sow. Well, maybe, but across multiple lives and also in other people's lives, it's more complicated than that if you start getting into karma. But let's think here for our purposes, okay, of karma as being a bit like, you know, momentum, inertia, um, res residuum, right? Like past actions continue to have an effect, basically. And if you consider that just in strictly mental cognitive terms, that's pretty obvious, right? So, you know, there's an expression that I quite like that I use with my clients a lot when I'm talking about sort of overgeneralization of models. And it's, a cat that jumps onto a hot stove burner will never jump onto a hot stove burner again, but it will also never jump onto a cold stove burner, right? That's about overgeneralization of models. It happens once and it has effects, but those effects overgeneralize. Okay, so obviously if something happens to you once, it's gonna to tend to affect things. Consider that statement, for instance, in, in terms of how you react to relationships. The further you get on in your life, right? Generally speaking, you will tend to see that the people that you date as they grow older will have more baggage. What does that mean? What's baggage? Well, baggage is all the hot stove burners they jumped on, basically, right? It's all the ways in which they've been hurt, all the ways in which they've been traumatized, all the ways in which their needs weren't met. A lot of that might carry over from their parental relationships to the childhood and that kind of stuff, right? But like, if somebody had a really bad relationship where their trust was violated, they're going to have a problem trusting. That's baggage right? But also it can be relative, not just to things that happened to them, but things which you yourself did. If you've really hurt people that, unless you're kind of sociopathic generally, that's going to tend to have an effect on you. It's going to affect the way that you think about yourself. It's going to mess up, right? Like if you lie a lot, you, for instance, will mess up your own modeling of the world in various ways, right? Something that we'll talk about further. Or to call back to the very first lecture, right? I, I gave this sort of short, you know, cautionary tale about trying to, you know, plagiarize or bullshit me. And what I said was like, you know, I'm pretty good at catching this stuff. I was a professional writer and I cut through bullshit for a living, but you might slip it past. I might be having an off day. You might be a master of deception. I, you know, that's possible, but that's not good for you. And it's not good for you because it will reinforce itself, right? You, if you win, you'll get that good winning, getting away with it feeling, and then you'll do it more and you'll do it more and you'll do it more, right? So it has an effect. Your isolated thing has an effect that rolls forward and it's going to impact on your mental formations, your patterns of action. We can think about karma a little bit that way, right? The past has an effect, right? Um, so you may be done with the past, but the past is not necessarily done with you, right? And then of course, there's the question of, of uh, you know, transmigration and multiple lives, but we're gonna leave that aside for the time being. Okay, so Skanda four, right? Sankara. And then there is uh, the, the fifth Skanda, which is uh, Vijnana. Uh, and that's sort of the reaction of consciousness. Now, um, this is a little complicated because it's it's not typically how we would tend to sort of think about this, but it's, you know, you could think about it in one way as being like a certain kind of reactivity. So, you know, if you build this up, it's like, okay, form, right? There is a thing, sensation, oh, specific qualities to the thing. Um, recognition, oh, it's, it's uh, you know, cinnamon, right? Uh, you know, mental formation, oh, a pumpkin spice latte, I could go for that, right? And da 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 da, da. Mm. And then there is a kind of folding back, there's the reaction of consciousness, right? There is the mind sort of touching itself again in this roundabout way. And uh, yeah, so it's this roundabout. There's more to it than that, but think about that as the basis. Now, the thing is with the skandhas, as I mentioned, 
the idea is that these things are are conditioned. They they one flows into the other. They're they're interconnected and and they flow together in such a way as they seem continuous, like a rapidly moving film, but they're not. And a big part of the suffering is this: you aren't the skandhas. See, the tendency is for people to identify closely with their mental experience. They have a thought, and it's them. It's my thought, right? And the point of, of the skandhas is that these things are empty of essence. They're not like, they're, they're not sort of solid entities. Our experience isn't solid in that way. Instead, it's the shifting group of interacting forces, interacting dynamics. Okay, the shifting group of interacting dynamics, it has no internal essence. And the sense of me that that stuff produces, right, me, right, I am my taste for cinnamon, I am my love of dogs, I am, right, that I'm my thoughts about that stuff, I'm what I think about things, my opinions, and so on and so forth, right, my tastes. No, that isn't you. That's the point. The point is that that's an illusion that the me that's produced in the movement of these skandhas is an illusion. Now, you know, there's a couple of interesting things that we can say about that really quickly, and then I wanna get into a meditation technique. In the cognitive science of sort of mystical states, there's a state that we refer to that was first described by Robert Foreman, which is called a PCE, a pure consciousness event or a pure consciousness experience, a PCE. And Foreman describes sort of a series of um, high level states, okay, that occur as you get deeper and deeper into meditation, right? And you begin to get a finer and finer degree of control over your, um, over your attention. And eventually, you know, you begin to be able to reach a, a state of awareness without an object, consciousness without content. Now, that throws people because a lot of people are like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, what would it mean to be having consciousness if the consciousness wasn't conscious of anything, right? Like, what does that mean? But that is precisely what the PCE claims. And you'll see that claim turn up in a lot of advanced meditative systems, right? The claim that it can be possible to attain a state of consciousness where you're still conscious, but you're not conscious of anything. Your mind is simply conscious, a pure consciousness event. Now, if you try to wrap your head around that, some of you may have had this experience. I've had it um, in bursts a few times. I know people who have had it more persistently in their meditative practices. Um, and I was involved in something of a project where we think we may be able to produce it more reliably. But um, you know, if you consider that, if you sort of identify in some sense with the skandhas, right? Then that just seems like nonsense on its face, right? Like, what are you talking about? You can't, consciousness is consciousness of something, right? And if you don't have contents, now there are some philosophical and cognitive science answers that we could give to this. And this is part of my work with John Verveke. We don't have time for that in depth, but I want you to just have the idea for a second that there might be a kind of awareness where all of that stuff that you're normally attached to is quiet, it's not there. And instead, there's just this background witnessing consciousness, but stripped of all of the things that normally fill your mind that you identify with, right? That's the pure consciousness event, right? Stripped of all the things that you normally associate with, all your memories, all your associations, right? All your emotions, all that stuff. Okay, pure consciousness event. So that's sort of one thing that, uh, you know, that I, I want to point at in this respect. Um, you know, the other thing that uh, I will say in this respect, you know, this, this notion that the scandals aren't you, you'll find that this actually is a somewhat important factor um, in some forms of, of therapy, uh, many actually. Um, and I like sometimes to reference, there's an expression that comes out of Ireland uh, my family used to think they were Irish. That's a story. And when I was 27, I discovered I wasn't Irish at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, I but I have Irish friends. And I, I mentioned I had Irish friends when I lived in England when I was at Cambridge. And uh, one of the expressions that the Irish have that I've, I always like, the Irish have a lot of lovely expressions. They have the largest average vocabulary of any English speakers. They're very verbal, very verbal people. 
by, you know, on average. Um, but they have this expression. Instead of saying, I'm sad, right? I'm sad. Instead of saying, I'm sad, they say, I have a sadness upon me. I have a sadness upon me. It's almost like it's weather. It's not you. It's on you. You have a sadness upon you, right? I've always liked that because it's, it's got a, a bit of distance, a little bit of separation. And we, many of us have been in a situation, right, where we've experienced depression or we've known people who've experienced depression who are deeply concerned that if something changes, that if they lose that feeling that they're losing themselves, this is who they are. They're a sad person, this is who they are. And I think that in many cases, sort of the, the response to that is this kind of disidentification that it's like, no, it's a thing that's happening within you. Like it's not you, right? It's, it's important. You should probably pay attention to it because it tells you a lot about your world and your environment and what makes you tick. But it is not identical with you, right? You have a sadness upon you. It's not that you're sad, right? So um, yes, that is in the main. These, these uh, sessions are going so fast that I'm trying to keep things a little short. So. I think many of you will see some distinct relationships here when we're talking about the, the skandhas. Um, right. So with an end to, with, with an eye to that rather, <clears throat> with an end in mind, here is the meditative exercise that I have in mind. Many of you will be familiar with this one already, but you know what? Even if you've done it before, it's worth doing again. So this is an exercise in mindful eating, mindful eating. So how does this work? Go get a raisin. Some of you may not like raisins, in which case, I don't know, pick something that is comparable, but you'll see why I'm choosing a, a raisin and not like a Tic Tac or, uh, you know, I don't know, a Hershey's Kiss or something. Um, although Hershey's Kiss might work, for, might work fine. So the idea is this, okay? Presumably at this point, you have been engaging in some amount of meditative practice, right? So there's the posture that I talked about, and I would refer you again to the Verveki, the link in the Verveki videos that I put on the syllabus. It's a, it's a good sort of groundwork for practice. It's gonna be more elaborated than what I'm doing here, right? But you know, you're dropping in, so you are, right? Making sure that your hips are above your knees, that your spine is, is holding a natural column that's holding you upright. You're breathing deeply with your belly, right? And your chest, and you relax. And you do a body scan, right? Progressive relaxation. Relax your scalp, relax your face, relax your neck, right? Work your way down as you breathe, right? Relaxing as best you can. And then you're entering this, this you know, state where you're following the breath. And anytime you have a thought pop in, you just grab it a little bit and sort of say, ah, thinking, put a verb and without losing, you know, your temper, put it off to one side. Now, if you have been meditating by this point, you are of course experiencing frustration. If this is your first go at this, you probably had some early success, but now you're like, oh my God, five minutes. Or if you're trying like hardcoring it to 10, um, it, it's like your monkey mind is really wild, okay? Mindful eating is a slightly more applied thing you can try. So I often recommend doing this actually after you've been sitting. Okay, so you've done your sitting meditation. Now the idea is you take a single raisin, not a bowl of raisins, not a bag of raisins, a single raisin or Hershey's Kiss, whatever, we'll see. And the idea is you're going to try to keep yourself grounded and centered in the center of the experience, but I want you to eat the raisin with as much attention as possible. Now, when we say attention, okay, and uh, I'm going to borrow John's language a little bit on this. When we say attention, there's sort of two ways that we think about paying attention, okay? One of them is a kind of rigid, hard focus kind of attention, right? So that's like, that's like we've got, you know, like a, a, a tube and we have it fixed on this. <laughs> Speaking of influencers, this brought to you by vitamin water. Okay. Um, you, you know, you've got it fixed in place and you're sort of staring, holding it in place. Okay. That's one way of thinking about attention. But another way of thinking about maintaining a focused attention is to think about a soft vigilance. Okay. So, you know, if I hold my finger up like so, and you notice how strangely shaped it is in some ways, if I hold my finger up like so, one way that you can hold your attention is this hard focus. You could 
kind of do that, right? Let's see if you can pop something, you know, right? It tends to not be very effective. But another way that you could do it is that you could look at my finger and you could shift around the finger with a sense of curiosity. You can look at how my finger isn't a complete cylinder. It actually tapers slightly. You could look towards the coloration. It's not just a simple, I'm not just a simple pink skin. Uh, in fact, I have, right, various striations and variegations. You can see glints and dots of sort of gold here and there, right, coming off the hair of my knuckles. You can see the whitening of my nail. You can see the glint of the light. You can see how there are sort of the wrinkles, the joints, and the articulation, right? You can move around, right, my, my looking at my finger in this way. If you were to do your own finger in this way, you could pay very close attention. Look at the, right, the tiny whorls on your skin, the individual prints, right? The linking together of the cells, the curvature of the hairs, right? But also the sensations within your finger. That's kind of soft vigilance, right? Where you're paying attention to a bunch of aspects that are all related, right? All kind of part of this, but you're not holding your mind in place in this way. This is how you should approach the raisin. So you have already sat in meditation. You brought yourself down. You've done the relaxation, five minutes, say, right? And now you're going to eat a raisin as mindfully as possible. You're going to kind of keep your attention on it and feel the sensations. Now, here's the thing. As you do this, you will simultaneously be aware of the raisin as a set of experiences that are bound together, but also you'll be able to focus on individual aspects, the texture of the raisin, the sweetness of the raisin, the smell of the raisin, right? The tackiness of the raisin, the finger feel of the raisin, right? Or whatever you're eating. Raisins are good because they have a little structure and they're sweet and they're kind of interesting and they're small. And this is a single raisin that we're talking about, right? So it's like trying to bring your attention to bear to, in a pretty low stakes way, let your mind explore around the raisin in that way. And that's what you want to do. You have a kind of a soft, vigilant curiosity towards it. Because this is the state that you're very often going to bring to bear on yourself. On objects in the world, of course, but on yourself. Not to react, not to gobble, but instead to be able to hold it slightly at a distance in your mind and explore these different aspects as you eat it. So, mindful raisin, okay? Give that a shot. And people keep asking, hey, I already do this practice. Can I do this? And hey, can I, you know, is it okay if I don't do this or I'm finding regular meditation, whatever? Look, try a regular meditation practice. So basically try something you're doing consistently. If you're already doing something, that's fine. Just experiment with some other things. This isn't specifically speaking a course in meditation, right? But it is intended to give you some access to experientially speaking, some of these techniques. And like, there's a reason that millions of people have practiced these techniques for thousands of years and that science is so interested in them. And that we think, you know, they're quite useful therapeutically speaking. So the idea is just like, look, it's a sampler, you know, try different things, you know, keep a regular techniques, so you get that the experience of persistence and the benefit of persistence across a few months, right? You may find you want to make it a permanent part of your um, schedule. Um, but also like experiment, experiment a little, explore, right? Explore with some curiosity, try different things. If you have a regular technique, okay, keep doing that. But also try some other stuff, right? If you've never done this raisin, try that. If you have, try it anyway, okay? So that is that for the day. Okay, I hope everybody is uh, doing okay around the first assignment. I know a number of people asked for extensions and as I said, that is fine. Um, and uh, yes, and how time flies uh, with these. So these were brief, but of course we will pick it up next week. Uh, and next week, I'm just double checking here. What, what is, uh, what, what's on the docket for next week? He said, having written the syllabus, what's on the docket for next week? Oh. My iPad's being slow. Here we go. Docket for next week. Oh, right, craving an attachment. Okay, that'll actually be, uh, that'll be quite interesting and it will carry on from stuff. So I'm gonna try to get deeper. Uh, I know that a number of you have expressed some interest in hearing more about the, um, 
dissociation aspects. Um, and certainly those will thread through the course to some extent, because it is a, a personal and uh, academic and research and professional um, therapeutic uh, interest of mine. So that'll definitely come up more as we go. Uh, but you know, I'll try to spread it through. I just wanted to make sure we were kind of hitting some core points. So next week is uh, creating an attachment, um, which I think you'll find is um, quite interesting. So have a good week. Uh, I shall see some of you this afternoon uh, at 4.30 uh, at my Zoom, available per the link on the front page of the syllabus, and I think I posted it up in Quercus too. Uh, and if you need to book office hours, those are available upon request booking, but they, they do get snapped up pretty quickly. So those are 1.30 to 3 on Fridays. Okay, good. I hope everybody's well. I uh, hope your assignment went relatively smoothly and have a great week. I'll talk to you soon.